So we started this series called The Prescription. God still heals last week. How many of you were excited about that? Not as many as I thought. How many of you are excited about that? And I just feel like this is a word and this is a time um, that people really need to hear about healing and really hear how that we serve a God who still heals. And so our springboard scripture comes out of, oh, hold on, the wrong thing is opened in my notes. Give me a second. There we go. Our springboard scripture comes out of Isaiah 53, 5, and it says this, but he, talking about Jesus, was wounded for our transgression. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and by his stripes we are healed. So we want you to know in this series that God still heals, and that healing is an essential part of the gospel. And so last week, Pastor Ken gave us three goals for this series, and I want to remind you of them, so if you're taking notes, write down. Our first goal is to build your faith in the promises of God for healing. The second is to equip you to pray for the sick and see them recover. And the third is to see healings in our church move from occasional to normative. And everybody said amen. And so today we're going to continue in this series. And the title of today's message is called Standing on God's Promises. So how many of you have a smartwatch? Anybody have a smartwatch by show of hands? My wife has an Apple Watch. And for a long time, I was a little jealous of her Apple Watch. Like, I thought it was so cool how you get notifications on the watch. It helps you with your fitness goals. And so I graduated college last year. It only took me 13 years to do it, but I graduated. Hey, that's a word for somebody today, though. Uh, when God calls you to do something just because it doesn't happen in your timing doesn't mean he still wants to do it. And so you can go back to college if God's calling you to go back. Anyways, 13 years. So I graduated college, and I ended up getting an Apple Watch as a graduation present. And I was like, oh, man, this is so exciting. The thing I love about it, it's got the little fitness features. You know, it tells you, like, how you're doing in your fitness goals for the day. Um, I think my favorite thing is that I can just look at my notifications and not have to use my phone and hit in call on somebody I want to talk to real quick. Don't judge me. Y'all know you do the same thing. The other cool thing is there's this little, y'all probably can't see it at all, but there's this little picture of my wife, and I can just click on it and either text her or call her right away. So it's got all these cool little features. And then I remember one day, I was just chilling on my day off. Anybody like to just chill on your day off? I was probably going through some Netflix show, but I was sitting on the couch for a long period of time. And, you know, it's okay to relax on your, some of y'all don't know how to relax. It's okay to relax on your day off every once in a while. And so I'm chilling, and I get this little vibration and notification on my phone, and it says this. Time to stand. I said, first of all, what you're not going to do is on my day off, tell me to stand up. Little watch. <laughs> I ain't about to take no commands from a little electronic device. If I want to sit on this couch, I'm going to sit on this couch. I ain't going to stand up just because you tell me to. But I was curious about it, and I was like, well, what in the world? Why is my watch telling me to stand up? And so I read this study called Stand Up, Sit Less, Stand More, Sit Less, Move More, something like that. Stand Up, Sit Less, Move More. And I thought it was interesting. Studies have actually shown that standing up, is healthy for you. And so I continued to read, and it says, when you stand up, there are muscles in your abdomen, your legs, and your butt that are working to keep you standing. And as they work, you know, I don't know all the science of it. Y'all didn't know you was going to get a science lesson today. But as they work, they use sugar, and they use triglycerides. And so standing can actually help lower the risk of diabetes and heart disease. So it's healthy to stand. But you know what? It takes effort to stand. Sitting down is a lot more comfortable. And I thought, man, this little watch is on to something. Because it's easier to sit down, but what's easy isn't always what's comfortable. And so I feel like a lot of us look like me sitting on the couch or sitting in this chair when it comes to the promises of God and his word. We're just sitting back, waiting for him to work his word, waiting for him to do what his word says, when really we're supposed to be standing on God's promises and believing for them. And so I believe that God sent me as a notification today for you to tell you that it is time to stand. It's time to start standing and stop sitting. It's time to stand on God's promises. It's time to stand on his word. And it's time to believe that what he says in his word is true. Amen? 
And so, I want to talk to you about standing on his promises today, but specifically when it comes to healing. I believe it's a word for today. There's so many people who are sick or tolerating sickness in their lives when really God has called us to be healed. And so before I can teach you how to stand today, how to stand on God's promises, there's some things I want you to know about healing. And so if you're taking notes, get ready. Here we go. The first thing is that God wants us healed. Now you have to say that and believe it. Say, God wants me healed. You got to say it like you believe it, though, like God wants me healed. So the word heal means to cause to become healthy again. The most common Greek word for healing in the New Testament is therapy. It's where we get the word therapy, and it means to restore to health. And I got excited about this because we serve a God who's all about restoring. We believe that God wants to restore our lives, but in the same way he wants to restore your life, he wants to restore your health. He wants you to be at a place of healing, a place where you are completely healthy. And plus, the Bible says it over and over. Y'all know it talks about healing 130 times in the Bible? I thought that was interesting. The word heal is used over 130 times. Now listen to this. Jeremiah 30, 17a says this. But I will restore you to health. Heal your wounds, declares the Lord. I think about it like this to make it practically. I got any parents in the room that have kids? Any parents in the room that have kids? A lot of y'all have kids. Anybody who has somebody they love, like a loved one? Nobody has loved ones? (laughs) I was trying to hit everybody in the room. Y'all got to work with me. As someone who loves somebody or as a parent of your kids, do you want to see them sick? How do you feel when you see your kids sick? I heard a parent one time that was like, actually, I think my mom said it. I'm going to give my mom some some credit. She saw me sick one time, and she was like, I would have rather been in your place. I would have rather my kid not been sick. And so there's this passage in Scripture, and it's Matthew 7, 9 through 11. And it says this, which of you, if your son asks for bread, will give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will give him a snake? If you then who are evil, now, side note, I had to, like, look up what God meant by evil here because I was like, yo, you calling me evil? That's kind of, like, I felt like that was heavy. But it really just means somebody who was in sin or, like, somebody who wasn't perfect like God is. And so if you who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, then how much more will your Father in heaven give good gifts to those who ask him? And so if you as a parent or a loved one wouldn't want your kids or your loved ones sick, and God loves us so much more than we can ever even imagine, he loves us so much more than we could love somebody else, why would God want his children sick? In that same way, God doesn't want to see you sick. He wants to see you healed and restored and recovered. He wants you to be in good health, and he wants you to have good things. It's okay if some of you aren't there today. We're going to get you there today. Number two, if you're taking notes, I need you to know that sickness does not come from God. Sickness does not come from God. When God created the earth and everything in it, he called it very good. Would you consider sickness very good? Man, you guys are participating so well today. I love it. Online, if you don't consider sickness good, put it in the chat. Just say no. And so Genesis 1, right, God made Adam and Eve in his image. He made Adam and Eve in his likeness. Now, God was perfect and knew no sin. So when he made Adam and Eve in his image, they were perfect and knew no sin. And you're like, how do we know that? Well, in in Revelation, it says that God is perfect. Listen to this. Revelation 21.4. It says that he will wipe every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. So if there's no sickness in heaven and God is perfect and he created Adam and Eve in his image, they didn't know sickness either. It's going to take a while for us to get warmed up today. Are are y'all here today? Okay, okay. And so when Adam and Eve sinned, That's when sickness entered the world and death entered the world. Listen to this. It says this in Romans 5, 12. Therefore, just as sin entered the world through one man and death through sin, and in this way, death came to all people. And so Adam's sin brought sickness or death, physical and spiritual. Plus, we know that sickness isn't from God because listen to this scripture. Acts 10, 38. 
It says how God anointed Jesus of Nazareth with the Holy Spirit and with power, and he went about doing good and healing all who were oppressed by the devil, for God was with him. I know sometimes in our world today, I feel like people blame the devil too much. I've said this before, we give the devil too much power. But when it comes to sickness, you can blame the devil. Sickness comes from him. And so when you get sick, it's like, "Uh uh-uh, devil. No, sir. Y'all know the song, Not Today, Satan. This is a time where you can blame him for it and stand up to him against sickness. Sickness does not come from God. You got to get that straight today. When you get sick, it's not because God's trying to teach you something. Now, maybe he could teach you something through it. He could show up faithful through it, but God didn't put it on you. It's an attack from the devil. But the good news is, when Jesus died on the cross, he atoned for all of our sins. He atoned for death and he atoned for sickness. Atone means to make amends. He bought back what was broken. He came and restored what was broken. He came and cleaned it up. How do you know that? I'm so glad you asked. It's in the word. Man, y'all got to get in your word, I'm telling you. Romans 5, 17. For if, listen, by the trespass of one man, talking about Adam, death reigned through that one man then how much more will those who receive God's abundant provision of grace and of the gift of righteousness reign in life through one man, Jesus Christ? So through one man, sin and death entered the world. Through another man, sin and death was taken out of the world. And the thing I love about God is God doesn't operate in partials. God operates in wholeness. Our scripture, Isaiah 53, 5, there's another translation that says, by his wounds we are made whole. Y'all know when God does something, he does it all the way. He doesn't leave parts missing. And so when Jesus came, he took our sickness, he took death, and he took our sin. I think about it like this. Let me give you a practical example. Does anybody have anybody in your household who is, like, really picky about cleaning? Did you have a parent who was picky about cleaning? Gentlemen, have y'all ever tried to clean the kitchen for your wife? So listen, I was cleaning the kitchen one time, and, uh, you know, I wiped down the counters. I cleaned the dishes. I thought it was pretty good. But Brittany found one spot that I didn't see. And she was like, you didn't wipe the counters down. I'm like, yes, I did. I wiped the counters down. And she was like, if there's one spot, it isn't completely clean. And I thought, hmm, if Jesus came to cleanse us, And we believe that he took sin, and we believe that he took death. Why would he leave sickness? If he left one spot, it wouldn't be completely clean. And so you have to believe that when Jesus came and took death and took sickness, or took death and sin, he took sickness with it. I read this quote on this, and I thought this was so good. Y'all got to write this down, share it, use it. It's powerful. It says that if sickness is a result of sin and Jesus took care of sin, then he took care of all of the results of sin too. And so God's will is not for people to be sick. I know I'm repeating myself today, but I'm trying to stir up faith in you that God does not want you to be sick. God wants you healed and hold and walking in strength. Amen? So the third thing I want you to know about healing is that it was a major part of Jesus' ministry. It was a huge part of Jesus' ministry. And listen to this. Jesus came to do the will of the Father, right? It says this in John 6, 38. For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. So this means, get this, get this. This is important today. Jesus was a divine revelation of God's will on the earth for all people and for all time. And so Jesus says that I don't speak unless I hear the Father speak, and I don't move unless the Father moves. So that means if healing was a part of Jesus' ministry, that God was about seeing people healed. Amen? Listen to this. Every single person that came to Jesus to be healed left him healed. Now, I'm going to fly through these, so I don't expect you to keep up, but just if you can, try to write down the scripture references, because I want you to hear that everyone who came to Jesus left him healed. Are you ready? Are you ready? Matthew 4, 23 through 24, they brought him all the sick and he healed them. Matthew 8, 16 through 17, he healed all who were sick. Matthew 9, 35, he healed every disease and every affliction. Some of them? Only the small ones, 
Every disease and every affliction. Matthew 12, 15, he healed them all. Matthew 14, 14, he had compassion on them and he healed their sick. Matthew 15, 30, they brought to him lame, blind, crippled, mute, and many others, and he healed them. Matthew 21, 14, y'all got to start clapping at some point. These are some great scriptures. Matthew 21, 14, the blind and the lame came to him and he healed them. And Luke 4, 40, I saved it for last because I thought it was so good. All those who had any that were sick with various diseases brought them to him, and he laid hands on every one of them and healed them. Every single person who came to Jesus to be healed was healed. And so here's my thought for this. If Jesus was about healing, that means God was about healing. And if God was about healing back then, that means he's about healing today. And he's also about healing in the future because God is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. And so if God was healing people back then, he can still heal people today. Come on, somebody. I need your faith to rise in the room today. I need you to know that we serve a God who still heals, who wants you to be whole and healthy. And... I, did, I, I feel like, I'm going to be honest with you, I feel like this is the difficult part about reading the Bible sometimes. Because Jesus had a full measure of the Holy Spirit. And I'm like, yo, yeah, but that was Jesus. And I hear other people say, yeah, but that was Jesus. Jesus healed them all. And I was like, yeah, but then he turns around and he tells the disciples to do the same thing. When he sends the 12 out, he tells them in Matthew 10 to, when I find my place, He tells them to heal every disease and every affliction. What did I just tell you that Jesus did? He healed every disease and every affliction. Then he tells the disciples to go out and do the same thing. And I thought this was interesting. I read this passage in Acts, and it's Acts 5, 12 through 16. We see the disciples doing the exact same thing. Now, at this point, Jesus had already died, resurrected, and ascended to be with the Father. So Jesus was not with them anymore at this point. And we pick up in Acts 5, and it says this. Now, many signs and wonders were regularly done among the people by the hands of the apostles. I love that one of our goals is to see healing in our church go from something that happens every once in a while to it being normative. It says they saw this regularly. That it was regularly done at the hands of the apostles. And they were all gathered together in Solomon's portico. And none of the rest dared join them, but people held them in high esteem. And more than ever, believers were added to the Lord, multitudes of both men and women. You want to change the world? You want to see people added to the church? When we start to pray for people and they start to get healed and signs and wonders and miracles follow, that's when you'll see people come back to God. And so they carried out the sick into the streets, and they laid them on cots and mats, that as Peter came by, at least his shadow might fall on some of them. Do y'all, like, like how do y'all read the Bible? Do you know how dope it would be for Pastor Ken to be up here and just pass by somebody and the shadow of his light heals somebody? Like, this is the type of stuff that we want to see. This is the type of stuff we're praying and believing for. Then it says, the people also gathered from the towns and around Jerusalem. Now, this is the part I want you to get. Remember when it said it brought, they brought the sick to Jesus and he healed them all? I read it to you 14 times. I hope you remember it. It says, the people also gathered from the towns in Jerusalem, bringing the sick and those afflicted with unclean spirits. And they were what? How many of them? At the hands of Jesus or the apostles? Hmm. So Jesus wants us to heal people just like he did. And the apostles did the same miracles that he did. I think that's interesting. Because Pastor Ken taught last week. There is a um, belief that healing stopped with the apostles. There's a belief that it stopped with the canonization of scripture. That once the Bible was made, that once the last apostle died, that we don't see healings anymore. And I'm like, yeah, but but as a Christian, aren't we called to be Christ-like? So doesn't that mean that we are supposed to continue the ministry of Jesus in the earth? So let me get this straight. If Jesus loved people then it's very easy for us to be like, well, Jesus loved, so we love. But when it comes to healing, why don't we say Jesus healed people, so we should heal people too? 
If it's a part of the ministry of Christ, then it is a part of our ministry in the earth today. Prove it. I got you. John 14, 12. Jesus says, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do. Does it say just the apostles? Does it say just Jesus? Does it say truly, I say to you, that once the Bible has been made, no, it says, truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do. That whoever includes me and it includes you. And so we're called to heal people just like Jesus healed people. Now, I want to be real with you today. Uh, there was a point in my life where I didn't believe anything that I just told you. Not a word of it. I grew up in a church that I'm thankful for my church. I'm thankful for the foundation of the word they gave to me. It was not this church, so y'all breathe. <clears throat> but I grew up in this church, and they didn't talk about healing. I didn't know that healing was even a thing. If we read about it in the Bible, they didn't present it as something that could happen today. It was just a story. And so I never saw people get healed. I didn't even know that existed. And so when I was 16 years old, I decided to play football. My mom wouldn't let me play football at all. Y'all, please let your kids play football. I'm just playing. Parent how you want to parent. I wanted to play football so bad. And so when I was 16, my junior year in high school, my parents were like, hey, you can go play football. I was pretty good, too, when I did. I was pretty good at football. Yeah, yeah. So I get out there. I'm playing football, wide receiver one, baby. I used to play basketball, so Hooper turned wide receiver. You know what I'm saying? I was out there killing it. But they were like, everybody kept telling me, hey, man, you need to be careful playing football. You're going to get hurt. First of all, why were they speaking that into my life? But that's a whole other lesson for another time. And so the second to last game of the season, I jump up in the end zone to catch a pass, and I land on just my left leg. And my dad said he heard the crack from the stands. I still caught the touchdown pass, by the way, just in case y'all are wondering. But I was, thank you, one person. Thank you, Tim. And so my leg, my leg was broken. And I mean bad. We went to the emergency room, and they were like, it's just a hairline fracture. I'm like, I've had a hairline fracture. This is not a hairline fracture. I was in the most pain I had ever been in in my entire life. And so one of the... Um, Parents at our school was a specialist um, dealing with ankles and stuff, and he used to be in the NBA and the NFL and training with those guys. And so we went to see him, and the MRI came back, and he said, don't put it up yet. I'm going to kill you guys. The MRI came back, and he said, um, I've worked in this industry for a long time, and I've seen this injury less than five times in my life. He was like, you've torn five ligaments in your ankle. He said, you shattered multiple bones in your ankle. But not only that, this is the weird one, and I still don't understand it to this day. The bone that allows your ankle to roll, your talus bone, cracked and had fluid in it. And so it softened up, and so if I would have walked, my shin bone would have smashed it. And he was like, the only thing we can really do is just give this time. He's like, I can't operate on it yet because that bone is too soft. He was like, so what I am going to do, praise God for people who will bless other people. He gave our family a $10,000 bone stimulator that I had to sleep with at night to try to strengthen the bone. And so MRI after MRI, month after month, he wanted to do it every single month so we could see if progress was being made. I had eight MRIs in eight months. And so go ahead and put the MRI up on the screen. And so I don't know if you guys know much about MRIs. This is not a baby. Somebody thought me and Brittany were making an announcement earlier. This is my ankle. <laughs> Y'all relax. But this is my ankle, and so I know you're not going to be able to see me real quick, but this middle bone right here is the one that was filled with fluid and really soft. But if you don't know anything about MRIs, basically everything that's white is either broken or torn. So you can see how messed up my ankle was. Now, you can take that off the screen now. At one point, um, my, my teacher at school came to my mom, and she was like, hey, there's a healing evangelist at our church. I know this has been a struggle for you guys. See if Josh wants to come. And my mom comes to me. Y'all listen to how much I did not believe in healing. My mom comes to me and she's like, hey, I want to take you to this healing evangelist so he can pray for you. I was like, why? I was like, what's he going to do, pray for my leg and it's going to get better? I don't want to go. So I didn't go. We went to my eighth MRI and this was the result that you saw. Everything's still broken. And at this point, the doctor was like, hey, man, we're going to have to look at some other options. I don't know that you're ever going to use this leg again because it's not getting any better. 16 years old, you do not want to hear that. I'm crying. We get home. Man, thank God for faithful parents. We get home, and my mom goes, enough's enough. Sit in the living room. <laughs> yes, ma'am. <laughs> she goes in the kitchen, gets some oil. She comes back, and she anoints my cast with oil and prays over my cast. 
We go to the ninth MRI, and the doctor comes into the office crying. And I'm like, here we go. You about to tell me I can't walk? You about to tell me, like, I don't know, nothing's getting better? He's like, man, I checked. I double checked. I made sure we didn't swap it with anybody else's. I don't know how to tell you this. All the ligaments have grown back together. All of the bones are healed. The bone that was filled with fluid no longer has fluid in it. It's completely solid. Your bone structure looks stronger than it was before you broke it. Everything is healed. I don't know what to tell you. My mom said, I know what to tell you. I prayed and God healed my son. I prayed and God healed my son. Woo! <laughs> Praise God we serve a God who still heals. Now, I would love to tell you that the muscles were all grown back too. But he cut my cast open and my calf was like. So the process wasn't over. I had to go to physical therapy, and I had to work on some strength training, and they had to teach me how to stand again. And so for the time we have left, if you will allow me, I'd like to be your physical therapist today and teach you how to stand on the word of God concerning healing. And so the first thing is this. It takes faith. It takes faith. Listen to this. Twelve out of the 19 people in Jesus' ministry were healed by their own faith. Jesus said, your faith has made you whole. Now, I know this, faith is not the only way to be healed. Because I know there have people, there have been people who you were praying, um, maybe for a loved one, you were believing for healing and you didn't see it. I, that doesn't mean that you didn't have faith. That doesn't mean you didn't have enough faith. But what I want you to know is that faith is a major component of seeing people healed. And so you say, well, how do we have faith? I'm glad you asked. Faith is where the will of God is known. Faith comes where the will of God is known. So you have to know what God's word says about healing in order to have faith for it. Let me tell you this. When I was coming back from my injury, one of the hardest things, and anybody who has had a leg industry or leg industry, leg injury, been in the sports industry, who knows where I was going with that. But when you've had a major injury, one of the hardest things to get back is your confidence. One of the hardest things is that when you plant on that foot, you got to know it's not going to give out. You got to know, you got to have full confidence that when you go to play again, it's not going to break again. But in that same way, how can you stand on God's promises if you don't know what they say? If you're in a fight, if you're being challenged with a sickness or challenged with something, how do you have the confidence to stand if you don't know what it says about what you're facing? And so you have to know God's promises. The second thing is you have to believe God's promises. This is tough sometimes. And it, it just simply comes from a choice. You have to choose to believe. There's a story um, when God told Isaac about Abraham. Y'all know the story of Abraham and Isaac? I'm going to give you the quick version today. God comes to Abraham and he says, I'm going to bless you with a son. Abraham's like 75 years old. He doesn't have Isaac until he's like 100. But there's a scripture in Romans that says, against all hope, Abraham hoped. Meaning he had no reason to believe. He had no evidence of it being done before, but he chose to believe anyway. If you are in a battle, you got to just make up your mind that you are going to choose to believe what God's word says. And you are going to choose to believe that it's true. Let me give it to you practically. I got any foodies in the room today? Foodies? Y'all like, oh, we going out to eat at service. Y'all look like, y'all like food. Let's go. So <clears throat> you go to your favorite restaurant, right? And you order your favorite meal. And you have full confidence that that waiter is going to take your order to the kitchen. Maybe some of you don't. They done messed my order up a couple times, so I'll be questioning them. But anyways, they take your order to the kitchen. And it takes more than the expected time for your food to come out. Now, you don't necessarily know what's going on behind the scenes, but you're upset with the waiter. Because your food hasn't come yet. But you got the audacity to still believe that your food is going to come. You got full confidence that at some point, they're going to come put your favorite plate in front of you. But what we do with God is we say a prayer, we give him our order, if you will, and it doesn't come in the time we want it to, not knowing what's going on behind the scenes, but instead of having full confidence, we look at God and go, oh, that doesn't work. 
we got more confidence that our plate will come than that God will answer a prayer in our lives. You got to choose to believe that God is going to do what he says in his word. But I will give you this. Abraham didn't waver through unbelief. But there was a story in the Bible where this man comes to God, comes to Jesus, and he says, if you can heal my son. And Jesus says, if you'll just believe. And he says, Lord, help my unbelief. And so I want you to know if this is a struggle area for you, all you have to do is go to God in prayer and say, God, help my unbelief. Help me to believe for healing. Help me believe your word. Help me to believe in you and believe that it's true. And he'll do it. If you ask, he'll answer you. The second thing is to speak on God's promises. Man, once you know what they say, once you believe what they say, you got to confess them over your life. Now, this isn't denying reality. You don't say, I'm not sick. This is something Pastor Ken says, I love this. I'm being challenged with a sickness or I'm battling a sickness. You don't claim the sickness. You just say, I'm being challenged with it. But then what you got to do is you got to turn around and speak the word out over it. By his stripes, I am healed. It says in the word that God will restore me to health and he will heal my wounds. I know I'm feeling sick right now. I know I'm being challenged with a sickness right now, but I know that my God wants to heal me. And so I speak healing over my life right now in Jesus' name. When Abraham was going to sacrifice Isaac, the story I just told you about, they got all the materials, they got everything ready to go. Isaac said, Dad, where's the sacrifice? And Abraham says, God will provide. He spoke it out the whole way there, God will provide. And when they got there, there was a ram in the bush, so he didn't have to sacrifice Isaac. I don't know what you're battling, but you got to speak out right now that God will heal me, that God will provide, and you got to believe it. The last thing is this. This one was tough. I prayed about this one. Act on God's promises. I said, God, how do I tell somebody who is sick to act? Because you have to use wisdom. My doctor told me not to walk. Well, in faith, if I would have walked without a word from God, that probably would have been pretty stupid. And so what God gave me was I felt like just stay ready. Stay ready. That's how you act on his word. You stay ready. So listen to this. I'll give it to you practically. They told me it was going to take about six months for my muscles to come back that I wouldn't play basketball for about six months. And so they gave me a minimum amount of exercises to do, but I did the maximum. I was preparing as if I was going to be ready sooner than what they told me. I would lay on my bed and I would practice my shooting form with a basketball. I was staying ready. I was staying prepared that God was going to do it sooner than what they said. And I was back on the basketball court in three months. Now, I know That is sports related, but I want you to hear the principle in that. Stay prepared. Keep acting like God has already healed you. Keep acting like you're going to wake up the next day and it's going to be done. Keep having faith that when you go to take that step that you're healed in Jesus' name. you got to stay ready and stay prepared for God to answer your prayers and fulfill his promises that he's given you in his word. And part of acting concerning healing is us praying for other people. And get a lot of amens on that one because this is really scary. You don't want to pray for somebody else for healing and then it not happen. But you know what? It has nothing to do with you. It has to do with God. All we have to do is just have the faith. If you never pray for somebody, how are you ever going to see them healed? If you never take the opportunity to lay hands, and it doesn't have to be crazy. Y'all ain't got to pick somebody up out of a wheelchair. I mean, if God tells you to, cool. Be careful with that, though, because if you pick them up and they fall, never mind. But... I'm talking about something simple. If you're at work and your coworker is like, man, I got a headache. Hey, can I lay my hands on you and pray for you right now? And you take the pressure off of you. Pastor Ken says this, and I love it. Sometimes when I pray for people, they get healed. Sometimes when I pray for people, the prayer comes true. It's really quiet in here. You got to step out of faith and just pray with people if you want to see people healed. And the last thing I want to talk to you about before we close today is this. I want to tell you why we can stand on the promises of God. I told you how to stand, but now you need to know why we can stand. And the first is this. God keeps his word. And you got to believe that. Numbers 23, 19 says this. God is not a man that he should lie, nor the son of man that he should change his mind. God doesn't change. Has he said it and will he not do it? Or has he spoken it and will he not fulfill it? It is literally a part of God's character to do what he says he is going to do. And so you have to believe that if he says it, he'll do it. And the second thing is this. It says God is faithful. 
Should have been a lot of amens right there. God is faithful. He says it 36 times in the Bible. Hebrews 10.23 says, let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering. For he who promised is faithful. 1 Thessalonians 5.24 says, he who calls you is faithful. And he will surely do it. Because we know that God is faithful. And because we believe that God keeps his word. We can stand on his promises. We can stand on his promises concerning healing, and we can believe that we serve a God who still heals. Say it with me. God still heals. God still heals. Come on, one more time. So you got to say it with confidence, like you believe it. God still heals. Amen. Amen. I feel like God put something on my heart today before we leave. Um, so if everybody would just bow your heads and close your eyes for a moment. If anybody is in here today and you are in need of a physical healing, emotional healing, mental healing, I want you to just stand up where you're at right now. Just stand up in your seat. If you need prayer for healing, I want you to just stand up in your seat. If you're watching online, wherever you're at, if you can stand up, stand up wherever you're at online. And I want you to do this today. Whatever part of your body that you need healing for, whether it's your mind, an arm, a knee, I don't, I don't know, you know where you need healing. I just want you to place your hand on that part of your body. Whatever you need healing for, place your hand on that part of your body. If you're watching online, place your hand. And people who are, are sitting, if you've got somebody around you, just stretch your hands towards them. Lay your hands on them. We're just going to believe for God to show up today. He's already here. But when we're in his presence, miracles happen. And so, God, we just come to you in prayer today. We call on you, Jehovah Rapha, the God who heals. I pray for every single person who's in here, God, that you would just increase their faith concerning healing, God. But right now, in Jesus' name, any sickness that's in their body, we command it to go right now in the name of Jesus. We thank you that your word says, by your stripes, we are healed. And so I speak healing into their body right now. I speak wholeness into their body right now. God, I pray that you would just show up in such a mighty way. They know it's from you. And right now, in Jesus' name, they are healed. And everybody said, amen. Hey, if, if you um, just got prayed for, if you notice a difference already, can you just raise your hand? If you got healed from something, come on, hands going up all over the room. Come on, y'all, can we just give God praise? What, what I told you today is not a fairy tale. It's not something that used to happen in the Bible. God still heals today. Let's just give him praise. Come on, you can do better than that. Lift up the name of God in this place today. Hallelujah! Come on. Oh, man, we serve a good God. Um, be seated for me one more time. I need to do something else before we go today. Heads bowed again and eyes closed. Listen, if you're in this place today, yes, Jesus came and died so that we could be healed. But the main reason he came and died was so that we could have salvation. So that we could have a relationship with God. So that we wouldn't have to have eternal death, but we could have eternal life. God loves you so much, he sent his only son to die on the cross for your sins. And so if you're here today and you say, I want a relationship with Jesus, like you're not sure that you've ever been saved and you want to be saved, if you're here today, I want you to raise your hand on the count of three. One, don't let the devil steal this moment from you. Two, God's called you here for a reason. And three, raise your hand if you want to be saved today all over this room. I see your hand. If you're watching online, raise your hand. I see your hand. I see your hand. I see your hand. I see your hand. Come on, hands still going up. Don't, don't, don't miss this moment. God has you here for a reason and a purpose today. If you're not 100% sure that if you died today, you would be in heaven with him, I want you to raise your hand to be saved today. One more time. I see your hand. I see your hand. I see your hand. I see your hand. Hands going up all over the room. God is moving in this place today. And so the Bible says that if you confess with your mouth and believe in your heart, that you will be saved. And so I just want to say a simple prayer with you. Everybody, let's pray together because nobody prays alone. Say this with me. Say, dear Lord Jesus, come into my heart today. Forgive me of my sins. Thank you for saving me. Thank you for healing me. And I promise to serve you all the rest of my days. In Jesus' name. And everybody said? Amen. Hey, if you said that prayer today, welcome to the family of God. The Bible says that all of heaven rejoices over one salvation. So there's a party going on in heaven right now. 
Hey, thank you so much for tuning in to Alive Online today. I pray that message was a blessing to you. I pray that the Holy Spirit just takes something from it. He illuminates it to where your life will never be the same again. If that's the case, make sure you let us know how your life was impacted and changed because of the message on today. We would love for you to share this content. You know, we have a saying in Alive Church that one invite can change a life. We also believe that one share can change a life. I mean, get your share on. God will use your share as a lifeline to reach people around the world. All right, if you like what we're doing here, we would love for you to be a part of our online family. You can do that by hitting subscribe. We want you to be the first to grab hold of all new messages and all new content as they are released. You know, the Bible says that when we give, It'll be given back to us. Good measure, pressed down, shaken together, and running over. And one of the greatest ways that you can make a difference and change lives is by giving. And so if you would like to sow into the ministry of Alive Church, hit the button below. And I know that God will bless you, and you'll also be a blessing to other people. We love you, and we'll see you real soon. God bless you.